Alice Onlin and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Security Token Show. We are your hosts, Hurry Konings and Kyle Sondland. This week, we'll be discussing the topic of market making and liquidity for the security token market. But before we do, of course, we'll proceed with our normal programming, starting with our companies of the week, followed by the industry news from last week, the latest in STOs, the trading activity update, and then finally, the main topic. And with that, Kyle, why don't you start us off? Who's your company of the week? Herwig, it is so good to be here. 44 weeks in a row, we're getting closer and closer to that 52 mark, that one year mark. I'm very excited. And my company of the week this week is the newest approval for an ATS license to trade security tokens. And as our listeners may know, the ATS license is the license that both Open Finance and T0 have received that allow them to trade security tokens on the secondary market. And so a few weeks ago, I noted that North Capital is a firm that was worked closely with security token industry in the past, and they had just received their ATS, and now we have another. And this one is coming from New York City's Rialto Markets, who is a broker-dealer that leverages blockchain technology for primary issuance all the way through to secondary trading, focusing on investment in private placements via regulated digital securities, according directly to their website. And so it was just announced that Realto has uh, successfully received their ATS license after going through this process and having to go back and forth with regulators to to get this approval. And Shari Noonan, who is the CEO of Rialto, mentioned in the press release that, quote, we have worked very closely with regulators for quite some time to assure that we have effectively bridged the traditional securities world with digital securities. We continue to believe that this is an important step towards creating a more efficient infrastructure for capital formation and secondary trading of private placements. And this is really exciting. Herwig, you and I have mentioned in the past that we have some concerns, or we used to have some concerns, at which the speed with which FINRA was approving applications for broker-dealer and ATS licenses within the blockchain and security token space. It seemed that using these terms and focusing on upgrading to the technological infrastructure of private securities used to cause delays in the application process. However, in the past few months, we have seen some tremendous progress and multiple approvals, which suggests that there does seem to be clear routes for new incumbents to enter into the space and compliantly innovate, which is the key. I'm speaking to the Rialto team this week, and I'm very excited to see what they have in store for 2020. So if I hear anything more, you certainly will get the updates on next week's episode. But for those reasons alone of them getting approved for an ATS and, again, using the proper wording to suggest that they are focused on digital securities and to security tokens and looking to advance the technology as well as just tr- trading with traditional private securities, they've earned my company of the week. Huge, huge news, Kyle. Congratulations to the Rialto team. Very excited to be speaking with them. And yeah, I think as you pointed out, they're perhaps, you know, the FINRA and SEC are getting a little bit more comfortable with digital securities or they're at least starting to to sort of streamline that process. So hopefully we'll see more and more of these ATSs get cleared because we know there are many more in the works. For my company of the week, Kyle, I want to, you know, really, really think this is one of the biggest ones of the year so far. In fact, when when I saw it, I knew I had to give it to the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation when they announced that they were embracing blockchain and digital assets. And the DTCC, otherwise as it's known, uh, is maybe a little less known to those outside of the Wall Street world. But it is the largest clearing and settlement company in the world. And just to put that into perspective, we're talking about clearing over two quadrillion dollars worth of securities transactions <laughs> across equities, bonds, and derivatives. You, you hear Kyle laughing, uh, rightfully so, because I said Q, a quadrillion, that's 1,000 trillions 
Uh, the sheer size of that is, is just insane. Um, but that's what they do. And the DTCC is so forward looking at the potential of blockchain that they're running two case studies, Project Ion and Project Whitney, to start exploring DLT and, and blockchain technology. So Ion's focus is the public market potential optimization of blockchain, while Whitney is, of course, then focused on private markets. The president and CEO of DTCC, Mike Bodson, said, quote, these case studies reimagine the private market's life cycle and the public market settlement processes, and they could significantly modernize and enhance how trading activity is processed in the future. We look forward to working collaboratively with our clients, regulators, and other key stakeholders as we advance these concepts in partnership with the industry. And then furthermore from the company, the head of clearing agency services and global operations, Murray Posmanter, said, quote, this is about working with the industry to further the value proposition on accelerated settlement, leveraging new capabilities such as DLT and tokenized securities, and to learn how DTCC can best deploy these technologies to deliver additional value to clients and the industry. I mean, Kyle, this is major, dude. The DTCC, it's the behemoth Fortune 500 company. They are the clearing and settlement king, and they are embracing security tokens and blockchain. I mean, I don't know about you, Kyle. I don't know about our listeners, but I've got goosebumps. This is just huge news. I'm expecting and looking forward to great results and efficiencies quantified by the case studies of Project Ion and Whitney. And I want to congratulate the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation for winning episode 44 company of the week and moving the industry forward in a big, big way. Absolutely, man. I think that if there were any concerns about this industry being some sort of fad or, or something that, that is, is just a mere flash in the pan, I think the last few weeks we have really cited some serious, serious financial players that have fully embraced the benefits of this technology and are clearly looking to explore this in its its full opportunity for for their business models. Whether it's it's what you're saying with the DTCC with two quadrillion dollars worth of settlements. Whether we're talking about the OCC, my company of the week last week, the Options Clearing Committee, even Nasdaq has embraced this technology themselves. It's coming for these financial players, but it's one of those things where, like with my company of the week last week. I think they were looking to deploy something as early as 2022 for their retail customers. So this is fantastic. This is awesome news. This clearly shows that they're building or working on something in the background and is suggestive that they're absolutely going to be upgrading their infrastructure moving forward. And then it's only going to be a matter of time before we start to see this really start to roll out for a lot of their internal processes in the next year to two to three years, something in that timeline. So very, very exciting and an awesome stamp of approval for the industry for sure. I mean, totally fair point, Kyle. Uh, Two quadrillion dollars worth of securities doesn't get moved on to. The, I think it's something <laughs> like sixty-three trillion as as you know what they they manage as assets. So you know the, for sure that doesn't get put onto the blockchain overnight. Uh, but very very exciting right. that they're they're exploring it. And like you said, I think within the next few years they're going to start rolling out major major improvements. Absolutely. And I think with that, I think we can start off the news. But before I do, I want to remind our listeners that all the articles that Kyle and I discuss on the show, they are sourced from stlmarket.com slash news. And of course, they're also available for reference in the about description of the podcast itself. Now, to kick things off in the news cycle, we have a major milestone for stablecoins. Zach Vole on Coindesk revealed that the total supply of stablecoins is now over $10 billion. According to the article, the stablecoin that represents almost 90% of the supply is Tether, which sits around $8.7 billion in supply. The USD coin follows that around $700 million in supply, and the Binance USD coin follows that around $200 million almost, followed by, of course, many other smaller stablecoin solutions. Zach goes on to analyze that altcoin cryptocurrency traders, aka those trading outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum, prefer to now use stablecoins coins instead of their more volatile counterparts. All in all, I consider this to be a really exciting announcement because there is now $10 billion in 
digital fiat currency floating around out there, all of it mostly private stable coins. So particularly, this means a lot because blockchain is now continuously being shown in expanded use cases beyond just Bitcoin, beyond payments with cryptocurrencies, well beyond ICOs, now to more useful financial instruments like stable coins and, of course, security tokens. So the more we can highlight blockchain as disruptive across the board, the sooner people will move past the stigmatism of crypto uh, currencies and start educating themselves on this incredible technology. And I think considering another major achievement for the space... London-based Standard Charter last week claimed the first WAN-based letter of credit issued on the blockchain. So in a transaction for a deal between Australian mining giant Rio Tinto and Chinese steelmaker Bao Steel, the bank helped carry out an international letter of credit using China's WAN currency on the blockchain trade finance network called Contour. Standard Charter actually originally invested in Contour during its pilot, and the platform is built on the Corda blockchain, and it's also worth mentioning that the CEO of Contour, Carl Wegner, was previously the head of Asia at R3. And he says, quote, trillions of dollars in commodities, products, and services are transacted daily, but the sector is still characterized by slow, duplicative, and expensive processes. Naturally, of course, his blockchain platform intends to fix all that, and I hope that it does. Let's see if the Contour platform continues to gain more traction with more institutional-level deals. Definitely never going to complain about putting more transactions transactions on the blockchain. And one thing that might, people might complain about is the potential challenge to innovation. So payments giant Visa is supposedly now seeking a patent for a digital fiat currency technology. So the U.S. patent application includes 11 mentions of Ethereum, suggesting that it may even be a blockchain supported by Visa's possible stablecoin technology, which is an interesting point. But also, it's worth mentioning more importantly that the focus is on the digital fiat currency model itself using a central entity, which in this case could be a central bank or a government to control that digital currency. This is obviously big news, especially if Visa's is getting into the stablecoin gain that's major for payment systems across the board. But it also might mean like the likes of Libra and others will have to come to patent licensing agreements with Visa before being able to launch. We'll see how all of that ultimately plays out. And eventually, that could actually come out to play, especially since Libra is gaining some you know, continued momentum in their uh, constant effort to rejuvenate its mission to launch with regulatory approval. And this time, it's through an announcement with Temasek, the huge Singapore investment firm. They have over $300 billion in assets under management. They have now joined as a member of the Libra Association. The international deputy CEO of Temasek, Chia Song Hui, said, quote, our participation in the Libra Association as a member will allow us to contribute toward a regulated global network for cost-effective retail payments. And on top of this new major member, Facebook-backed stablecoin initiative also added San Francisco-based cryptocurrency fund Paradigm and venture fund Slow Ventures as additional new members. So again, continuing to grow uh, the Libra Association, but really all eyes are on the Swiss regulators FINMA because they are the ones being the target of focus to potentially grant Libra a pilot environment to launch in. So maybe we'll have an official response for Libra soon. And once we do, you'll better believe you'll hear it here on the podcast. And an announcement from a cryptocurrency that's currently ranked 43rd by market capitalization, Icon, says that the Icon Foundation has officially entered into a partnership with Liechtenstein-based blockchain firm LCX to develop a security token infrastructure. The CEO of LCX says that partnering with the Icon Foundation will allow them to deliver more innovative solutions in the long run, starting with security token standards and cross-blockchain payment capabilities. The founder and chairman of the Icon Foundation, Min Kim, similarly said, quote, I remember meeting Monty and the LCX team in Liechtenstein in December of 2018. We're impressed with the progress that they've made in the security token space, and we're excited to explore opportunities for ICON. We are proud to partner with LCX to exchange knowledge and expertise with the intention to enable international growth of digital assets. So really great news. I mean, for me, this is at least the first word that I know where ICON is supporting security tokens directly. And, you know, sitting behind other blockchains, Tezos and Stellar, who are our 10th and 11th, respectively, on the market capitalization list, uh, both heavily supported security token infrastructure. So maybe this will help ICON move in and break those potential top 10 charts. 
And moving over into the U.S., I think we got a lot of big news, starting with a fresh announcement from Open Finance. And no, it is not an update regarding their upcoming May deadline for trading platforms uh, to read for the trading platform for their security token issuers to renew and pay additional fees in order to stay listed on the platform. And uh, there is no news around that, despite you know a lot of interest that it created. But in fact, it's actually an announcement about new listings coming to the platform, specifically through a partnership with crowdfunding platform Republic. The CEO and co-founder of Republic, Kendrick Wynn, says that they are excited to partner with Open Finance Network in order to create greater liquidity for their investors, as well as create new opportunities for non-accredited investors to invest in startups. The crowdfunding platform, it's worth noting, is part of the Angelus family and has already successfully completed in many transactions. Perhaps now we may see those get converted into tokens and then listed on OFN. Republic already supports security tokens according to their website, but no STOs have been listed yet as far as I know. Soon I'm sure uh, that will change thanks to this new partnership especially. So Kyle, we'll definitely have the scoop, of course, uh, with your segment uh, on the market uh, show in, in the future when they do finally launch some STOs. And don't forget, they actually did come out in their announcement of delisting saying that they may list non-tokenized securities. So Republic does also have you know, traditional equity crowdfunding securities on Solely. their platform. It will be interesting to see whether the STOs or, or, or assets rather coming from Republic are in fact security tokens or if the, the ones that will be listed on OFN are, are traditional equities um, that's because then we're going to have to monitor for sure. Really, really great question. Will we be enabled to trade outside of OFN with our Republic investments, or will they remain just digital within OFN? Great, great question, Kyle. We'll only find out in the future. And another trading platform, this one not being live, has made some progress towards doing just that, though. As a regulated exchange, the Boston Security Token Exchange being developed by T0 and Box has faced scrutiny by the SEC so far, which is in change, you know, which, you know, SEC is, of course, in charge of giving the exchange the approvals it needs in order to go live. So in an effort to try again with the SEC, the BSTX has resubmitted their rulebook to the SEC for review. Lisa J. Fall, the CEO of BSTX, says, quote, our mission to become the first regulated security token exchange is not something we take lightly, and this refiling allows the SEC more time in this current unprecedented climate to review our submission. We've already seen substantial community support and interest in what we're building, and we look forward to continuing our work with the SEC to bring the industry the first of this kind exchange. So let's hope that she's right that this new refiling will work in achieving that vision. Uh, it is worth mentioning that the commentary from the SEC last April wasn't that positive. I hardly think that this is the climate of Corona's fault. I think it's more about the communication and education, and the BSTX is you know on the front line and getting that done with the SEC. So hopefully they they make some good headway. We'll likely get another response from the SEC in the next few months on that. And next up is an announcement from Polymath saying that in on June 23rd next month, the company will launch the Aldebar and Testnet, allowing for testing of their permissioned chain. The Polymesh network, which is the dedicated blockchain for security tokens being developed by Polymath, will be using the Aldebaran blockchain, and this is the test net that we'll be launching. The, the main net there is slated for launch sometime in Q2021, with the test net, of course, being live next month. They're now looking for a couple testers to help drive the beta test before they officially launch the test net. And another issuance platform in the U.S., Securency, also made a big announcement last week as well. You know, they've partnered up with Saudi-based Musharraka Capital. The two firms have signed a framework agreement to create a compliant platform for issuing security tokens in Saudi Arabia. Musharraka CEO Ibrahim Fahed Al-Asaf said, quote, This is surely a fintech leap. Such projects were not feasible a few years ago due to a lack of consumer demand. However, as the economy shifts to digital trading and consumer trends develop, we are introducing developments that didn't exist in the Saudi market. And securities securities John Hensel added to that saying, quote, together with Musharraka's strong leadership team, Securency aims to stimulate the growth of businesses in Saudi Arabia and streamline foreign investments into the kingdom. 
Looks like security tokens are coming to Saudi financial markets thanks to these two firms. And this, I think, also continues to spark a trend of U.S. issuance platforms supporting foreign security token markets, such as Securitize doing with Japan and Tokensoft did last week with Siba and Tokensoft International in Switzerland. And the last announcement I have for you from last week was quite the PR stunt, I should say. It was an STO by the name of BHD Global from Singapore issuing a press release saying that the SEC actually approved their STO offering and that they have applied to be listed on Coinbase. So naturally, this is a pretty big statement, especially since the SEC has never approved an STO because, well, they're already legal. It's a digital, it's a, it's a technology. And it's also because that would imply that BHD Global was doing Doing a registered offering if they were actually getting approved in some kind. Now, of course, we can dispel this one right away. All the company did was file a Form D, which is an exempt offering registration. This only requires you to fill out a document and send in the information to the SEC. There is no approval for it. So already, this company is misleading investors by trying to create some kind of shinier effect to the fact that they were approved by the SEC when, of course, no such thing was the case. And in addition, this PR stunt mentioned being listed on Coinbase, which would mark the very unknown BHD Global STO become the first security token to be listed on Coinbase ever. That would be major news given that Coinbase is one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the world. And of course, alas, this too is not real. Anyone can apply to be listed on Coinbase. It is, again, a form that is available online to fill out. If one did their research, they would see guidelines on that very same page by Coinbase that spells out that they will not accept security tokens token listings of any kind, especially this was a pointless application and that was essentially dead on arrival. But again, this company used it as an opportunity to imply some kind of liquidity or relationship with Coinbase, which again, wasn't the case. So the press release actually did manage to fool a Cointelegraph writer for a short period of time until they witnessed it, wisened up and, and updated the article, of course. So even the press release itself seems nowhere to be found now. But regardless, I wanted to bring this one up because because this is exactly you know what SEOs should not be doing and also if you're listening you know I hope you now realize you know that you need to do you know your research on everything statements like SEC approvals and major partnerships need to be verified with trusted sources in the era of digital investments it is essential you always do your due diligence that's why we always recommend speaking to all the experts when it comes to investing your lawyer accountant and investment advisor and then finally, moving on to some thought leadership, we have a great article by Robert Anzalone on Forbes covering the overstock dividend. There's not any news covering that specifically. I think Kyle has some updates for us there later in the show. But actually, it's an article highlighting the value proposition of the digital dividend and digital stock. And I love this article because this is exactly the point of security tokens and what we are trying to preach here. Try to look beyond the underlying asset, in this case, the over do- overstock.com stock but actually the use case itself. History is being made as a public company is issuing a digital dividend of digital shares to its shareholders. Robert dives into exactly that value proposition, and I highly recommend this read. I mean, did you know, for example, that Dole Foods acquisition resulted in a $115 million settlement because of conflicts in shareholder records? These are very serious issues, and there's a very real value proposition in the blockchain, people. And this next piece is by a fintech leader in Japan, Norbert Gerk, a founder and representative director at Tokyo Fintech, and also previously at Goldman Sachs and Barclays. He says that the country's economy and business transactions are still highly paper-based. And Norbert goes on to cite the current blockchain ecosystem and regards to regulation and treatment of different digital asset types in the region. Norbert makes the case for Japan transforming into a fintech economy, and I think he's right. I did my own article on the meteoric rise of the Japanese economy security token ecosystem in just one year. So this is another good article if you're interested in that region. And then we can end on some real estate articles here. The first is written by two attorneys at DLA Piper, which is a leading global law firm. Scott Teal, who leads DLA Piper's Asia Technology Group, and Jonathan Gill, a lawyer in DLA Piper's Hong Kong Real Estate Group, 
write about how real estate will become liquid through security tokens. And I think it's always great to get a lawyer's take on things. So I figured this one was worth sharing. And if that article about real estate gets you excited, you can top it off with this next one titled All That You Need to Know About Real Estate Tokenization to Guest Post on Crypto Money. So it's unclear who wrote it, but I found it as a decent summary of all the benefits for security tokens in real estate. And that's it. That's all I have for you lovely listeners today. I hope you all enjoyed the new scoop. And now it's time for Kyle to tell us about the industry virtual events coming up. Great work, Herwig. As always, anything that we discuss on the podcast is in the description of wherever you're listening, as well as stomarket.com slash news, where we have kind of a, a message board that we submit all of our articles, and then you can comment and vote on different articles that are more relevant or less relevant and and have a, a conversation rega- around those. So definitely do either of those and, and participate, or you can send anything to Herwig or myself via LinkedIn or Twitter so that we can cover it if you have any interest. Absolutely. Moving into the industry events, we only have one this week. I, I've had a couple of different Zoom webinars, and I've been, been perusing Eventbrite to try to find other events. Unfortunately, I only have one to bring it this week, and it is one you may have recognized. This is the Draper Gorin Hall. Home Digital Security Summit, and it's the virtual edition. Draper Gorin Home has hosted many events in the blockchain, security tokens, and crypto space in the past, so they've done a good job with that, and they're looking to host another one here. This one is on May 27th now. It got pushed back a week from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And they will be working with security tokens realized for the event, which is another security token uh, and blockchain organization that hosts events we actually were nominated for one of the uh one of their awards at their last event for for i think one of the biggest adopters in the security token space or something like that so um thank you to them for that nomination but but this is has nothing to do with an award ceremony this is a draper gorn home and security tokens realized secure digital securities event so this workshop will be uh working with onera which is a london-based portfolio company of draper gorn home as well as executive from City, Fidelity Investments, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, State Street, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, IBM, R3, Societe Generale, ING, BNY Mellon, UBS, LSE, Banco Santander, Archax, and potentially others. So there is a, a quite a lineup there of different events and, and speakers that they're going to have in attendance. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. I, I, I believe it might be free. I'm not exactly sure what the ticket prices look like they have on their Eventbrite link that there are still details to be determined. So check that one out. I think that one's going to be pretty legit and uh, you're going to get some great info out of it. Moving into the new STOs and STO updates, like last week, unfortunately, we haven't seen a new security token offering come to market over the last week, certainly as as the tumultuous economic times continue to play out. I think that a lot of issuers are, are maybe sitting on the sideline for a month or two and then coming in strong by the start of Q3 is, is something that I would I would look forward to. So I do have a couple of updates on security tokens. One, Herwig, you hinted at in your news section, and this is about Overstock.com, who is the parent company of T0 regarding its security token dividend being issued on Tuesday, May 19th. So according to sources, the issuance is still on track to launch, and they are going to be issuing a stock dividend to public overstock shareholders at a 10 to 1 ratio. So if you own 10 shares of overstock, the parent company as of, I think, April 27th was the the date of record, uh, you will get this distributed dividend into that same brokerage account. And so the way that this is going to work, you'll see your new digital shares reflected in your same brokerage account. So then at that point, you need to transfer it from your current broker to your uh, a broker that can trade on the T0 ATS. And the only broker so far that can trade on the T0 ATS is Dinosaur Financial. So you're going to need to have an account on Dinosaur. You're going to need to transfer your current digital dividend from your current brokerage account, whatever account is you're managing the stock, and then transfer it to the Dinosaur Financial brokerage account that you've just made, which case will allow you to trade those overstock digital dividend onto the T0 platform. So it is a little bit of a process, but it does show the benefits of having a digital tokenized asset is that it is very easy to transfer it from one account to another in, in, in a 
seamless or eventually one day, hopefully seamless way. So that is going to be the process for that um, in terms of trading. And it does look like it will be available to all retail investors on secondary markets if you missed that, that dividend date. And so the token's performance itself, the OSTKO token, will be updated on SDOMarket.com moving forward as soon as we can, can integrate that token onto the platform. And we will cover it in the podcast beginning next week once we have accurate trading info. It's going to be fascinating because, again, this token is mirroring the public shares of the company. But since there's uh, you know some other flashy bells and whistles, it will be interesting to see if it trades at a premium because it's a, a blockchain token that could potentially be accessible for international investors easier than the public equivalent. Or will it be trading at a discount because of you know the fact that there's a little bit more friction involved in terms of getting it onto your account and maybe there's less investors on the T0 platform and less demand than, than what you're seeing on the public market. So it'll be fascinating to see how that works. I certainly expect it to mirror, at least relatively, uh, the public market equivalent just because they are essentially the same thing. The other update I have for you is just a reminder. Uh, this is one we're going to cover in much more detail in the next, I would say, maybe a month from now. But this is about the Curzio Equity Owners Token. We had mentioned this one weeks and weeks and weeks ago, I think in 2019, covered it on the new STO section as Frank Curzio was launching his security token offering. And he has closed that offering and the lockup for investors does end in July. So that token will be live on secondary markets in July, or at least it will be available to be live. We don't have any info regarding if that token will hit secondary markets or which one specifically that that team is speaking with. But it is important to note that that fundraiser was successful, and they are going to be trading at some capacity um, once the lockup ends in July. Moving on, we have the market update. We have a, a quick market report that I wanted to highlight. This is a research article published on the Security Token Market blog. This is from STM's Jonah Schulman, who did a deep quantitative dive into the Security Token Market's performance and compared it with the public U.S. stock market. I love this idea. We covered an episode of the podcast where we talked about comparing the public market's performance to the security token industry kind of right at the beginning of this coronavirus economic slump. But Jonah takes an even more detailed look and looks at the correlation coefficients between token performances and the indexes or exchanges like NASDAQ. He, his regression analysis showed that tokens like T0 and Blockchain Capital do in fact have strong relationships with public market performances, while many of the real estate properties performed independently. This does confirm what might seem relatively intuitive regarding different asset classes performing independently of each other, namely real estate versus equities, but it does further demonstrate one of the many benefits of security tokens, namely that the ease of transfer of any asset allows for much more diversification on a fractionalized level than ever before, which only protects investors from those market risks. So it's a great report. He goes into very much more detail than what I summarized there. And if you're interested in checking out some of his more quantitative analysis of the correlation coefficients between these assets and many of the public market equivalents, you should check out that article on the STM blog. Now we look at the market data and how everything's performing. The total STO market cap is 58 million, which is up from last week, you know, five to 10% up. We're having a steady increase, particularly driven by T0, which is up another 10% this week, reaching nearly $1.30 on, on the close Monday after already hitting it Thursday after holding steady over the past week. The price is beginning to, to increase with some consistent momentum, presumably in preparation for the digital dividend of parent company Overstock, which I mentioned, that is launching on the ATS later this week. Remember that the token holders of the shares of TZROP, the T0 token, are entitled to a revenue share with the T0 trading platform. So they are entitled to some of the profits or some of the revenue, I believe, that T0 makes on each trade. So shareholders of T0 are certainly going to appreciate new traders and a new asset on the site moving forward. Both of these tokens will be available to retail non-accredited U.S. investors. So hopefully this token does increase the, to see the traffic over the entire platform. They can get more volume. And again, with more volume results in, in more revenue for the shareholders, resulting in a more highly demanded 
token and asset. So that's fantastic news. Would definitely be something to watch. And potentially, if they can get a third asset, like they hinted at in their shareholder letter in Q1, if they can get that third asset live, then that would be a real game changer. In terms of other tokens in the market, the rest of the market was pretty firm the rest of the week, which is great. We'd much prefer it to be firm than on the decline. Many of the OFN tokens have remained relatively illiquid, and the real estate tokens continue to hold their value very well with paying that consistent dividend. And that's about it for me on, on the market update. It was a relatively slow week again. Uh, I think that, that uh, we're still waiting to see some, some, I think, fresh life to be injected into the market and, and maybe overstock and provide a little bit more of that as well. Thanks for that info, Kyle. Great update. Seems like there's definitely some upcoming stuff in the, in the security token markets to look out for. And with that, I, I think we can jump into our main topic. And Mm -hmm. so, Kyle, with news of all these security token marketplaces, including your company of the week, Rialto Markets, in addition to recent news stories like the PPX from North Capital, iStock's official launch, Tokenize launching, Merge, you know, having launched, and Exchange being live, Uniswap, liquidity solutions, and the like coming about, liquidity is now becoming a a very real and important topic, I I think. And I thought that you and I were having a rather interesting conversation the other day that, that I think we should bring on the show. Specifically, you were telling me the importance of other players in the secondary market outside of the issuer and the exchange themselves. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Definitely. So for today's main topic, I want to take a look at a key facet of secondary market liquidity that often gets overlooked by the public. And that is the one of the financial services that can make or break an asset's liquidity, namely the market makers. And so one of the main benefits that has captured the hearts and minds of industry professionals inside and outside the industry, including myself, is the idea of a live secondary market for security tokens, which allows for free trade of any asset between investors all around the world. Many incorrectly simplify that this complex idea of liquidity means that it's only about enabling trade on secondary markets. In other words, it's a common misconception that having a place to trade your token will immediately result in a secondary market forming around the asset. As we've seen in less than liquid markets in the public sector, just having a place to trade does not mean that someone wants to buy your asset on the other side of the trade. Relying on simple supply and demand principles for obscure assets can be a very inefficient process. In the event of these harsh realities, firms have created niches in the secondary market to facilitate trading and to grease the rails, if you will, to reduce trading friction in the markets. So before we dig into secondary markets, I want to quickly define liquidity. I think that that's crucial. The term liquidity is sometimes misused, so remember that liquidity can be defined as the ease at which an asset is converted into cash. That's pretty much all it is, is is the ease at which that happens. And the, the point of that is that it's on a gradient, it's on a scale. So if it is difficult to swap an asset for cash, like traditional real estate, for example, discounts must be applied to the asset in order to incentivize a buyer into making the purchase. In this way, we can properly quantify how liquid a market is by determining how much of a discount or a premium, depending on the demand, is applied to an asset. So if there is extreme discounts applied in order to trade it for cash, that would be something that is highly illiquid because you'd have to take a serious devaluing of that asset in order to get that back to cash, which you could then spend into anything. So remember, liquidity is on a gradient. It's on a scale. I'm glad you did that, Kyle, because obviously, you know, over the last few years being in the space, we've seen liquidity be a term that, that people use incorrectly and, and almost see it as kind of black and white, like an on and off switch, uh, as if it's either something you have or you don't have. And depending on whether you can directly trade your token on an exchange or not. And so suddenly tokenization means liquidity. And the reality is, is the liquidity is a state of demand and volume for an asset that is something that needs to be cultivated over time by various different players, I think. You're totally right, Herwig. A key piece in cultivating liquidity is known as the market maker. And the market makers define the bid-ask spread and provide fulfillment of secondary market orders placed by investors. So in this way, market makers act as both buy and sell investors, allowing single trade investors to immediately find a trading partner for their transaction, which increases the opportunity for them to convert their cash into stock or their stock into cash. 
The market maker will determine a specific quantity of an asset that they're comfortable committing to purchase into the future at a set price, known as the bid price, as well as a quantity of an asset that they're willing to sell to the market at a different price, known as the ask price. The difference between the bid price and the ask price is known as the bid-ask spread. By setting up a tranche to provide liquidity for, the market maker will buy all stock within the predetermined bid price and will sell to all investors within their ask price. This clearly improves the flow of asset transfer as investors immediately have fulfillment for their desired trade without needing to actually find an individual looking to take the other side. In exchange for providing the commitments on a specific asset, the market maker pockets that bid-ask spread, which can be as small as fractions of a cent in the public markets, as well as as up to to tens or or more cents in in the private markets or in small cap uh, stocks. So on top of that, they can take fees as well as commissions that they can charge directly to an asset issuer or to an exchange who are both heavily dependent on the market maker to improve the investor experience for that asset or the platform. In practice, most of the biggest market makers in public markets are the brokerage firms that investors trade with. So if I make a trade on TD Ameritrade, I'm not exactly transacting with NASDAQ for my Apple stock. I'm actually buying shares of TD's reserve at their ask price. In this way, the transaction can happen almost immediately and is managed much more efficiently. In this example, the bid-ask spread would be very low because of the high demand of Apple stock. The bid-ask spread is dependent on a myriad of factors, but the two keys that are relative trading volume and asset volatility. Because the market maker has to manage inventory, they're directly exposed to the market risk for that asset. Right? If I have a ton of this Apple stock that I'm trying to sell over time to make this market, I'm owning that Apple stock. So if it increases or decreases in value, I'm the one taking the haircut. So the quicker that I can sell or move my shares in inventory, the less likely that I'm going to have to experience a significant depreciation in value. Therefore, the shorter the bid-ask spread is because I need to get paid less in order to take that risk. That's why if you look at after-hours trading in the public markets, the bid-ask spread for the same asset increases from less than a cent to potentially two, three, or more cents per stock. The reason here is because there's less trading volume and therefore a higher likelihood of asset volatility. So the bid-ask spread needs to adjust for that new risk coefficient. Exchanges are primarily responsible for establishing market makers for their trading pairs. Ideally, multiple market makers are employed for each asset, which requires the brokering firms to compete for the lowest bid-ask prices to provide for the investors. That way, they can concede commission based on pricing, based on the volume of shares executed by the making firm, in addition to allowing collection of predetermined bid-ask spread amounts, as well as the equity value accrued in the inventory. In case, if you're a brokering firm, you are exposed to, let's say you have the inventory and Apple stock goes up. Now you've made yourself capital and it does allow to offset some of that risk. Market makers are crucial to liquidity because they ensure that the flow of trading is seamless between all participating investors. Another key feature that market makers can inadvertently provide for stagnant markets like some of the observed assets in the security token space is price consistency. As we've seen with some assets on exchanges like Open Finance, it seems that there is really no established price for many of these tokens. There is a trade history, but each trade seems to be at a different price, with tiny orders quickly tipping the price balance. So we see trades of 10 or 15 shares, which could be no more than 20 bucks in total, that changes a token's price by double-digit percentages, as well as the market cap by millions for a $20 trade. Due to a lack of liquidity and asset availability on top of price discovery, the assets trade wildly and have no capital to establish the market. A firm deciding to take a large position in an asset, let's say like BCAP, Blockchain Capital, for example, and creating a bid-ask spread of $1.45 to $1.30, it would allow investors to easily enter and exit the market with established prices. That bid-ask spread meaning that they bid at $1.45 and they ask at $1.30. So you need to buy at $1.45 and they will sell it to you at $1.30. So this, or the other way around. So 
This would allow investors to easily enter and exit the market at those established prices. And with enough inventory, a market maker can prevent slippage, which is the idea where a large buy or sell causes extreme price changes due to a lack of people that are on the other side of that specific trade. This would allow investors to buy and sell shares of the VC firm without directly affecting the price each time. So think about how much healthier it would be for the market to allow these buys and sells to occur at a stable price versus having the price change from 130 at a buy order, then fall to 110 on the next sell, then increase to 145 on the next buy, just to drop back to 120 for the consequent sell. The bid ask spread seems realistic at 15 cents, but it could increase at a larger bracket if the demand isn't quite there. So while this would result in additional cost for an investor, the ability to quickly enter and exit the market at a consistent and stable price is the most important priority for all parties together. Early market makers in the security token space are unlikely to be brokerage firms like seen in the public sector. One realistic example of a market maker in our industry could be a large backer of a specific security token. With confidence in the underlying security, a fund may recognize the opportunity to capitalize on market making fees for an asset that they are already directly invested in. By facilitating trades of their asset, the market would be healthier, directly resulting in better pricing and less chaos for that asset. The firm capitalizes on the fees charged for their services, keeps the bid-ask spread, and isn't worried about asset risk because, as a large investor, their long-term vision for the asset is positive and the immediate market risk is protected by their outside funding. Another way to look at this is how market making works in low cap equities, junk bond sectors, or even the crypto markets, where many of the funds invested in these initial sales were the ones managing the trades on the OTC markets. By providing a high level of price consistency and asset availability, the volatility of these assets is drastically reduced, allowing investors to properly price the asset based on its merits of its investment opportunity, not on the liquidity risk. What a wonderful and, and great breakdown of the role of market makers there, Kyle. Yeah, for me, I personally think a key to adopting market making will be through the broker-dealers who help manage the primary offerings for some of the newer security tokens and even the exchanges themselves to provide a network of market makers to help bring stability to those trading venues for the issuers that are listing their assets. So when you hear terms, for example, like hedge funds capitalizing on arbitrage pricing, This is an example of how they can do that. By market making for the same asset on multiple exchanges, the fund is now providing liquidity for investors while also being able to set prices and capitalize, of course, on the different preferences for investors in different jurisdictions or platforms. Therefore, the service of market making is very much so a key component for a security token that all issuers should be thinking about. And no matter who ends up providing these services, I agree, Kyle, that this is an underdeveloped facet of the market right now and can see the benefits in having more firms providing these services in the long run. In fact, it's it's probably critical. Anyway, I think our listeners are definitely more clear on the topic of liquidity and market making thanks to this. That's what's important. And if you are an issuer working with an exchange or vice versa or trying to provide tools for liquidity to users, be sure to keep the role of the market maker in mind. You bring up a great point, and it's actually something that Uniswap has done so far with their decentralized exchange is we've talked before about about how they power trading pairs. We we covered this a little bit in a different episode. But the way that Uniswap works is you can actually stake your Ethereum, which essentially means that you lock it up inside of the Uniswap exchange. And in exchange for, for staking that Ethereum, you're actually market making for a specific trading pair of two different assets that you're powering with that Ethereum. And then you, as the staker, the fees you get for staking your Ethereum are actually some of those market making fees. So there are ways that we can start to work around having somewhat of a decentralized market making system, kind of like what you've mentioned here um, earlier in your point. There are some ideas like that, but then there, again, are also, there's plenty of room for for big, big market makers like brokerage firms and like large funds that can also play a huge impact in that entire marketplace. I think definitely definitely sounds like we may have an episode in the future where it's blockchain for market making. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) And how that disrupts that industry. uh, Especially as that scales. Yeah. So as I mentioned in my newest analysis piece on the security token market performance for April, liquidity does not just consist of investor access. 
Do not forget that. Just because someone can buy something, it does not mean that they will. And how the market infrastructure is constructed is the crucial piece. So with that, I think it's a wrap. So thank you to all of our loyal listeners for listening to another episode of the Security Token Show. And welcome to all of you first-time listeners. I hope you enjoyed your stay. As always, check out any of the links on stlmarket.com slash news. Hit us up on the socials for conversations, questions, articles, leads, or anything else on your mind. Coming to you every Tuesday morning, I'm Kyle Sondland. Join with Herbert Konings, and we'll catch you next week. <laughs>